let me request Ash to please come and deliver a lecture in honor of a clearly a very great man. 69 years ago, a new nation was born uh, out, of an, out of a very ancient one in rivers of blood. 66 years ago, the people of India gave themselves a constitution which drew out both the roadmap and the rules and most importantly the values and principles that would govern the democracy of this new ancient nation in extremely troubled, challenging times of communal conflict, of extraordinary inequalities, of widespread hunger, of looming famine, we need to start by recognizing that despite its flaws, India still sustains a robust, vibrant, colorful uh, uh, democracy. And that remains our most precious strength. Average life expectancy at, at the time of independence was about 35 or 37 years. Uh, today it's, it's 67 years. Today, while on the one hand we have the third largest population of dollar billionaires in the world, every third child who is malnourished and underweight, every third child in the world uh, who, who sleeps hungry is also Indian. At the time that our constitution was written, we, the people, made a promise to we, the people, that India would be a country where it would not matter which god you worship or if you chose to worship no god. It would not matter if you were a man or a woman, if you belonged to this caste or that. Uh, uh, it would not matter whether you spoke this language, wore this dress, ate that food, chose to love this person rather than that person. You would be a fully equal human being, a fully equal Indian. You would live, be free to be yourself, to live your life the way you believe it should be lived, your heart free from, from fear. There were four, you know, the preamble of the constitution lays down the four principal pillars of our constitution. It talks about justice, social, economic and political, liberty of political uh, choice, of thought, of expression, of belief, of faith and of worship, equality, and it stresses equality of status or condition and equality of opportunity and fraternity. And it, it says fraternity to ensure both the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation. India continues to be a land where millions are not able to escape the fatal accidents of their birth. India continues to be a land where what you are born, man or woman, and where you are born, into which family, which caste, which religion, and so on, uh, which class, determines the rest of your life. So we continue to, you know, so the social inequalities of caste and gender continue to be dominating uh, uh, life. Uh, our social and economic life. I, I'm still talking about, and these are overlapping, we're talking about justice, social, economic and political, uh, the first of the pillars of our constitution as promised in the preamble. For religious minorities and for Dalits, we also see recurring attacks of violence, mass violence, that target them only for the fact of, of the religion uh, to which they belong, uh, or, to the, or the caste to which they belong. And we see also, uh, you know, in, as far as justice is concerned, uh, something that 
we describe sometimes as impunity. Impunity means basically the assurance that you can commit a crime and you will not be punished. And uh, I'll never forget what one of these survivors in Gujarat, how he described impunity to me. He said, if one person kills another person in a closed room, there's a greater chance that he will be punished by the law of this land than if one person kills a hundred people in the presence of a thousand people. That person is most likely to, to walk free. And I think that when we talk about justice, uh, our, our, our failures uh, you know, to protect, you know, the promise that you would be equally protected by the law of the land completely breaks down uh, for uh, our religious minorities, for our uh, Dalit and for our Adivasi people, and for women over and over again. In case I'm suggesting that our failures of justice are only in extraordinary situations of riots and militancy and terror attacks, we would forget the everydayness of embedded injustice. Uh, uh, to the poor and to people uh, of socially disadvantaged groups. As a human rights worker, one of the things I've learned is that if you want to see who are the most oppressed people in a country, look at the populations in the jails. Who constitutes the majority of people in jails? And you will know who suffers the greatest injustices. Uh, if you look at for instance, you know, uh, uh, there's a study which has been undertaken by the National Law University here. Uh, it's a seminal study, uh, an extraordinarily morally important study because it's trying to see who are the people who have been awarded the death penalty. And it is, you know, you know, it, it should wake us all up to see that almost none of those people, all of those people, almost without exception, are extremely poor. And uh, there's an overwhelming majority of three communities among them, uh, Dalits, Muslims, and tribal people. So either we believe that they are the ones who commit the most heinous crimes in our country, or we recognize that the criminal justice system is weighed against them in many ways. But I'm talking also of, you know, ordinary small crimes, uh, the under trial population, which once again has an overwhelmingly large majority of these three communities. And uh, it's very hard to get permission to get into jails, but uh, we were given, we finally took permission from the National Human Rights Commission. So I think that the failures of justice, both in times like riots and terror attacks and militancy, but also in the everydayness of injustice, uh, is the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about. The second pillar uh, of, uh, and, and, and one more thing here is, is, uh, is that some of the worst injustices of the legal uh, system really is for, for the most destitute. So uh, I think um, of all the laws that we have, perhaps uh, the most unjust of all, uh, you know, competing with the terror laws in AFSPA maybe are the beggary laws that we have inherited from the British, uh, where literally begging is defined. The definition of begging says, one of the definitions of begging is having no ostensible means of livelihood, which in simple words is destitution. And this is seen to be a crime for which you can be picked up and uh, summary trial. And really I've seen magistrates who simply you know, just look at your face and decide whether you were begging or not. Uh, one of them like, sees your hands and says, if your hands are soft, like most of ours are, then we would be begging, because it means I'm not doing hard work, and, 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 and so on. So things like this. And the consequences of it, you're put into jail for one year, three years, and it's not a jail, it's a beggar's home. And if you ever go into a beggar's home, it's many times more hellish than any jail. Uh, because they are for, for, for really powerless people, so they smell, there's no... Uh, uh, so, so you're trapped inside this because of your destitution. And for repeated offenders, you can be in for 10 years. So I think that, that uh, 
and, and I, I calculated actually the running cost of keeping these people in, uh, in these places uh, was about one lakh a year. Uh, and you know, it doesn't occur to us that for a destitute person, can, if we could use that one lakh in order to help that person rebuild his life instead of criminalizing him into, uh, and so on. So I think the everydayness of injustice is one of the things that worries me deeply. The second, and, uh, the second pillar that, that we need to reflect on is liberty or freedom. And, and, and I think that for a democracy, its greatest, you know, one of its, one of its greatest strengths is, is, the, is to preserve or protect the right to dissent. And we are seeing governments and you know, governments in the past as well. I think after, in fact, Nehru and Shastri, uh, almost every government has been more and more impatient with uh, voices of dissent. We talked about liberty of expression. Uh, we talked, uh, you know, in, in the constitution, we talked about liberty of belief. And the liberty of belief is something that we held very precious and of worship. But today, you know, the whole campaign, for instance, around Gharbapsi, uh, seems to suggest that Ghar is, is of one particular faith, which is of the majority community. And anyone who chooses to move out of it has strayed away, is the prodigal son or daughter, and has to be brought back home. Uh, laws that criminalize religious conversion and uh, you know, and many of the laws that have been passed are actually talking about, uh, you know, uh, force and fraud, including even uh, uh, the the threat of divine uh, retribution. Uh, in which case, most conversions would then get criminalized. And our constitution, uh, founding fathers and mothers were very clear that we had the right not just to worship the way, to, to follow our beliefs, but also to propagate our beliefs. And then laws like cow slaughter and so on. I worry more and more us, of us becoming more and more similar to becoming a Hindu Pakistan. Because these laws are really like the blasphemy laws, which are criminalizing uh, 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 people of minorities in, uh, in Pakistan. And is that the direction that we need to go? the restrictions on diet and on, on dress. Uh, but one more thing that I wanted to say, that, that, that the leaked ID report, uh, which actually was set up by the earlier government, but then got sort of strengthened and, and, and uh, deliberately leaked, talked about something very interesting. They said there's national uh, sovereignty, but there's something also called, which they call economic sovereignty. So they say that if you criticize India's current economic growth model, so, so to, in order, anyone who is unhappy or has dissent with the economic model on environmental grounds, on grounds of labor rights, on the ground of you know, women's uh, rights at, at, in the workplace, on the grounds of of justice and equity, uh, that is now described as something that is uh, against economic sovereignty, therefore anti-national. Uh, and, and the IB report actually says the activities of these people who have opposed India's economic model has cost India's 2 to 3 percent of GDP growth. I don't know where they got this figure. But basically, the idea is that it is today anti-national. So I, you know, I, I'm called uh, by people at the very highest levels uh, in public meeting. Uh, I've been described as as a Maoist, for instance. The questions of equality, uh, the third pillar. I've already talked a, a lot about, uh, you know, in our, in, when talking about the failures of economic justice. Uh, the failures of equality as well. And, uh, you know, there's evidence of mounting inequalities in India since the 1990s, since this new uh, economic uh, model was, uh, 
uh, was adopted by governments. I, you know, in the, you know, uh, in the brief time available here, would not would not would like to talk about my concern not just about the facts of growing inequality uh, in India and in many parts of the world, but even more so about the normative framework where this inequality is considered justified uh, uh, and uh, you know, at least inevitable if not even justified. So where we consider that, that we inequality without outrage, uh, inequality with indifference, inequality that is considered as appropriate uh, uh, in the world that we live in. So what he is saying is that we are seeing the equivalent invisibly amidst us of a great Bengal famine playing out year after year after year and we don't even notice. We have so much normalized inequality among us. So I think that the changing idea, you know, the, the acceptance, the normalization, the legitimization of inequality has also led to uh, a changing idea of the good state. Uh, some people say that China has comparable levels, for instance, of, of inequality as India. But I think the, the important thing to understand is that the consequences of that inequality are much greater in India because we don't have a, a framework of at least public provided and provisioned and guaranteed health care and education and so on. So, the consequences of being at the bottom of the inequality in India is far more painful because I don't then have access even to uh, minimal health care when I am uh, uh, when I am uh, out of work, uh, where, when I'm uh, unwell or my children don't have access to decent schooling and, uh, and so on and so forth. And in this situation, you know, we often talk about aspirational India and young people and so on. I think we forget, suppose you really wanted to talk about young people and who can aspire. We forget that the total percentage of young people who can complete college, any kind of college in India today, is not more than 7%. Uh, for women it is about 4%, for Dalits it is about 4%, for rural uh, youth it is about 2%. So who is aspiring, who can aspire uh, in India? So what is, for the median, for a median young person today, what do they look forward to? The last pillar, and the one that I think gets most forgotten, is the pillar of fraternity. Now what does fraternity mean? And why was it considered such an important pillar of democracy? Uh, the word fraternity literally means brotherhood, and I think there's a problem there, so we're talking about both brotherhood and sisterhood. But, uh, but the Hindi version of the Constitution actually uses a lovely word. Uh, it's you know become one of my favorite words because the word is bandhuta, bandhuta to describe fraternity. Bandhuta, in a sense, in a literal sense, would be mean an ideology of friendship, an idea, the idea, an ideology that we belong with each other. And I think that fraternity is first and foremost this idea of solidarity and mutual belonging. That we must take care of each other. Fraternity or bandhuta is also for me the idea of empathy, of public empathy. Empathy literally means feeling the pain of another. And I think that it's important to, to understand that empathy is actually two things. It's first an act of imagination and then an act of feeling. And I think that we've created such separate worlds from each other in the India of today that it's hard for us even to begin to imagine. And finally, the question of fraternity is, is, is finally the idea of, of love, of, of mutual respect 
of accepting each other in all our diversities. Uh, we use the word tolerance often, and I don't like that term. It's not about tolerating our differences. It's about understanding and celebrating. Do you know which is the most diverse state in India? It's Arunachal Pradesh. The point that I'm trying to make here is that this, this is and should remain a country where even the people who spoke that, the 300 people who speak that language are equally Indian. They belong equally in every way. Elderly Muslim women, I don't know why he also specifically mentioned, he said elderly Muslim women in our country are not learning English. And until they learn English, they're not welcome. Uh, the idea of being accepted in France is that you have to accept a certain idea of being of, of French culture and language and so on. To me, the idea of being Indian is that you should not have to conform in any way in order to belong. You should be free to be yourself in every way, in your worship, in your language, in your dress, in your food, uh, in your sexuality, uh, uh, all your choices and yet belong equally. That to me is ultimately the idea of fraternity. And it's an idea, you know, if I look at the four pillars of our constitution, I find justice under assault, I found, find uh, freedoms under assault, I find uh, equality under assault, but perhaps what I find most under assault today, in the India of today, is fraternity. And that is what perhaps we need to claim most vigorously, even as we, as we fight the other battles. And these are all closely interrelated. Thank you.